Good evening. Good evening. I see lots of familiar faces. It's so lovely. So lovely. I just know you all now. <laughs> it's great. Um, good evening. Uh, very good to see you. My name is Dr. Julia Budnik and welcome to SDS Thursday. We are expecting a big group today because the topic we will be discussing is incredibly interesting and very, very practical. So uh, that is why it would be lovely if everybody keeps themselves muted and uh, focus on the screen. So as always, I will ask you, first of all, to put a few words about yourselves in the chat, because uh, we are trying to create a sense of community. And it is always very nice to read little descriptions which people put in the chat about themselves. Um, what is your professional background? Where you are in the world? Um, what settings you're working in, are you interested in this particular topic? And the question which I particularly like to ask is whether it is your first SDS Thursday or whether you've been here before. And if it is your first, how did you hear about us? Obviously, if you've received an email from us, then it is clear that you already have been registered with us and, and we've sent an email to you. So uh, if you can please just type for a few moments, I'll put the chat on so I can, I can see it. And before, before we start our presentation as such, I want to share one piece of very happy news uh, and I hope you will be as excited about it as I am. Paul's new book has just been published and now available on Amazon worldwide. So Paul Grantham, I want to stop procrastinating now. I know that Paul is running, or you know probably, I definitely know, Paul is going to run two days event based on the program described in this book. And I can see uh, a person, Linda Widows, who uh, has been to this event. She was one of the first people ever attending this I Want to Stop Procrastinating Now events with Paul many years ago. I can't even remember, maybe five or six years ago, Linda. Yes, and actually Linda's feedback about that event is featured on the cover of the book and I will read it for you. Uh, Linda said, the program was excellent. I continue to use the things it covered and have shared much of it with friends and clients. One of the most useful, if not the most useful training I have ever attended. And that's completely Linda's words. She won't let me uh, trick you because uh, it was completely unsolicited feedback. And this book is now out and available. And the very first copy which I've ordered, I don't have the real copy yet. I only have proofread. The very first copy I've ordered is on the way to Linda and should be with her tomorrow. The excellent thing about this book is I've arranged a 50% introductory discount for SDS customers. So for a few days, it will be sold at 50%. And then we will start market marketing it to general public and we'll bring it to the full price. The full price is $17.95. And the introductory price, actually, I'll share the screen and show you the book on Amazon. Yeah, here. Yeah. So the introductory price is $8.95 with full price at $17.95. So it's a good chance and a good time to buy it. And I hope you will. And I hope you will be kind enough to leave your review on Amazon. I just wanted to mention that book is large format because it consists 20 exercise sheets, which you complete yourself or 
ask your clients to complete. And that's why we've decided to publish it in a format as close to A4 as possible. So you could photocopy these sheets, as you can see. It's a very large font. And overall, we, we know that we had some positive feedback uh, about workbooks to be published in, in this sort of large, large font and uh, in large size. So it can be used uh, as practically as possible by everyone. So that's one piece of news. Uh, and talking of the books, our presenter today has published a very popular book as well on Amazon. It is, although it wasn't published on Amazon, but it is available from Amazon. And it's called Psychiatry and Mental Health, a guide for counselors and psychotherapists. So I'm sure Rachel will be able to say a couple of words about it. But before she does that, I will stop sharing and pass the floor to Paul, who will introduce our speaker formally. Paul, please. Um, thank you very much, Julia. And thank you for the very kind words about, uh, about my book as well. Um, I'm really excited about not just this evening, but the course that uh, Rachel is going to be running in a couple of weeks time. Um, it always strikes me that um, despite um, protests to the contrary, there is still a very strong mind body split that operates in many ways in the work that we actually do. And that for that particular reason, anyone who is involved in talking therapies has something of a tendency of treating anything to do with body treatments and, and which obviously we're thinking about primarily here in terms of medication that's prescribed tends to treat it at arm's length it's either ignored uh, or it's seen as something that shouldn't be touched or shouldn't be thought about um, it's also, incidentally, for many people, I'm not necessarily saying that's the case for you this evening, but for many people is seen as, I think, in some ways, sort of automatically negative. And I, and I think that, that there's a really interesting question here about, um, really, if we're going to be working most effectively with our clients, we actually need to have an intelligent and an informed attitude towards psychotropic medication. And um, I, the chances are extremely high, I don't have to tell you this, of course, that actually the overwhelming majority of certainly folks that I would work with, and I suspect for you as well, will be receiving and consuming at least one psychotropic drug um, for a, a wide range of, of problems that they're actually dealing with. And knowing what the impact is of that, I think is just really important. Uh, they, there's the actual impact of the drug as it is um, intended. There's issues of side effects. There's issues of withdrawal that are actually around. And um, I think if we're gonna be the most effective therapists that we can actually be, I think having an informed uh, position on this is an absolute prerequisite. So I actually think that we are extremely um, blessed, I would go as far as to say, to have doc Dr. Rachel Frith um, here this evening and, and running the course in a fortnight, because Rachel combines two things which in my opinion are pretty rare. She um, is both a qualified and practicing psychiatrist, but she is also a qualified person-centered counselor. And so she's able to bring to bear two quite different traditions. And I know that, that one of the things that's really important to her is to build bridges and to, and to facilitate communication between those two different traditions. So um, I'll say no more. I, I will pass you over to Rachel, who will be giving you just a little bit of a flavor, really, of some of the things that she's going to be opening up um, in a fortnight's time. Um, I can't remember if Julia mentioned this, but just to remind you, if she didn't, this is a six hour course, but it's split over two days in two chunks. Um, and uh, so, so it's just worth bearing that in mind. Um, but I'm sure that, that uh, Julia will pop some more details about that uh, on the chat box later on. So I will hand you over at this point um, to Dr. Rachel Freeth. Thank you very much, Rachel. Mm. Thank you, Paul um, and Julia. And I hope you can hear me okay. Just unmuted myself. Yeah, great. 
Um, well, hello everyone, um, and welcome uh, from me to this talk about psychiatric drugs and what is important for therapists to know about them, particularly some of the issues to consider when working with clients who are taking a psychiatric drug, which as Paul said, actually uh, is are many clients these days. So let me first of all uh, introduce myself a bit further and give you a bit of an idea where I'm coming from when talking about psychiatric drugs. So I have worked as an NHS psychiatrist for many years, working in a number of different settings over this time, both in psychiatric hospitals and uh, as a community psychiatrist, serving the working age adult population. But throughout most of my psychiatric career, I have also been a person centred counsellor. I previously worked in the voluntary sector, but since leaving my psychiatric job last year, so in other words, I'm actually no longer a, a practicing psychiatrist. I now work in independent practice as a counsellor. So I have straddled two very different worlds for most of my working life, and this has not been easy, particularly as my core humanistic and person centred values have not fitted comfortably into the world of psychiatry. However, this background has given me a broader perspective on mental health, distress and disturbance. And I've thought a lot about different healing and helping responses to those experiencing mental and emotional distress and disturbance. And it's also given me an ability, I think, to interpret psychiatry for the therapy community, uh, which I've done through teaching and writing. And my book that Julia mentioned is very much bringing together both my backgrounds um, and trying to interpret one to the other. It's also worth adding um, that I've for many years been a member of the Critical Psychiatry Network, which is a network of psychiatrists that takes a critical position in relation to many aspects of psychiatric practice, including the prescribing of psychiatric drugs. And many of us in the network challenge the scientistic emphasis within mainstream psychiatry. So this is not a rejection of science, but a rejection of the dominance of science and the biomedical model at the expense of psychosocial um, understanding and the relational and, and non-technological um, therapeutic aspects of helping people. This, I hope, uh, gives you some flavour of my, my interests and biases. Now, before outlining what I'm going to talk about uh, this evening, I should say that despite the title, the subject of psychiatric drugs is really not simple. <laughs> to think seriously about it is to attempt to grasp many complexities of a philosophical and conceptual nature, not least what we mean when we talk about mental health, mental distress, disorder and disturbance. It opens up many debates, questions and controversies. For example, do we tend to view mental disturbances such as depression or anxiety as medical illness or and as understandable or even normal reactions to the difficult, challenging and traumatic experiences life may throw at us? So there is much more to the subject of psychiatric drugs than knowing about the different types of drugs that are prescribed, when they are prescribed and what their effects might be on the brain and the body. I do think it is helpful for therapists to have some basic knowledge on this and certainly to know where to access information about drugs. But I suggest it is also important for therapists to consider a whole range of issues that might arise when working with clients who are either taking a psychiatric drug or who have perhaps been recommended to take a drug or situations when you, the therapist, think your client might benefit from being prescribed a psychiatric drug. And these issues go beyond simply having factual knowledge about drugs. And I shall highlight some of these issues in this talk and also, of course, at more length uh, in the course later this month. I hope that what I say will weaken any, any temptation to avoid discussion about drugs with clients. That said, I'm not suggesting therapists step into a role that belongs to the medical profession or prescribers. I am suggesting, though, that therapists are in a position to have the kinds of discussions that doctors are 
either not interested in having with their patients or they might be interested but do not have the time, space, or perhaps even the skills to have certain types of discussion. Therapists may therefore be uniquely positioned to support clients to think in more depth about, for example, the pros and cons of taking a psychiatric drug, whether and when to stop taking one, or the role of a drug alongside or instead of other forms of support and help. And Therapists can certainly provide a space for clients to say how they feel about taking a psychiatric drug. Needless to say, this also requires therapists to consider their own views about the potential helpfulness or unhelpfulness of taking a psychiatric drug and consider where they stand regarding the complex debates about the role of drugs as a response to mental and emotional distress. And there is a broad spectrum of opinion and belief within the therapy community as there is within the psychiatric community. What is certainly unhelpful, I believe, is not to have examined or questioned our beliefs, our own beliefs and opinions, but simply to make assumptions about what is truth or fact. For the subject of psychiatric drugs, as for most aspects uh, of psychiatric practice and mental health care, we are really in the territory of cultural and individual values and worldviews, which in the West is dominated by the medical model. For the remainder of this talk, I will focus on two areas. Firstly, the role of psychiatric drugs and how we might understand what drugs do. And secondly, I will briefly offer a framework for thinking about the ways psychiatric drugs may impact on the therapeutic or therapy process, whether or when drugs might complement or support the work of therapy, and whether or when they might interfere or conflict with this. And I think this does require quite a sophisticated understanding and ability to grasp multiple perspectives that in my, my experience is often lacking and is challenging. First of all, then, how do we think about the role of psychiatric drugs, i.e., how do we think about what they do? I'm not going to present here any detail on how drugs act on nerve cells, i.e., their mechanism of action, other than saying that they act on the neurotransmitter systems within the brain. And I will present uh, more detail about this on the course. Rather, I want to address questions of a more conceptual nature that is ways of thinking and understanding. And in this, I draw on the work of Professor Joanna Moncrief, who is a UK practicing psychiatrist, researcher and academic. And Moncrief has opened up very important debates about the place of psychiatric drugs when responding to mental distress and disturbance. And I'm gonna try and uh, share a slide here. Let's try and bring this up. Uh, OK. OK. So hopefully you can see that. So what Moncrief describes is two ways of how to think about and understand what drugs do. Now, the first is the widely accepted view that drugs are prescribed for mental disorders or illnesses that are caused by some underlying physical pathology, malfunctioning or disease process. And this she describes as the disease centered model. And one of the most popular disease theories has been that of a chemical imbalance in the brain, specifically an imbalance of neurotransmitters, which are the chemical messengers enabling communication between nerve cells. And drugs are very commonly thought of as correcting these imbalances, for example, of the neurotransmitter serotonin in depression or dopamine in experiences sometimes diagnosed as schizophrenia. This is how drug companies have described their drugs, that they balance chemicals in the brain. And this has often been, and sometimes still is, what doctors tell their patients. However, what many don't realize or take seriously is that the idea of a chemical imbalance is just a theory 
and despite years of research, it has never been conclusively proven, um, conclusively proven that um, that mental disorders are caused by chemical imbalances. And in any case, what is a normal level of neurotransmitter? It's nevertheless a powerful and simple idea that drugs correct some underlying pathology in the form of too much or too little of a particular neurotransmitter. And the names of categories of drugs suggest this antidepressants correct depression, they're an antidote to depression, and antipsychotics correct psychosis. So to repeat, in this disease-centered model of psychiatric drugs, drugs are viewed as treating particular diseases, i.e. reversing a malfunctioning process. And it has a natural appeal because of the idea of fixing an underlying problem or physical pathology. And it is, a very, it is also a very marketable idea, I suggest. And, and by the way, I'm not suggesting here that uh, that what that that what happens in the brain and body is irrelevant uh, when it comes to mental distress and disturbance, um, because I think certainly our physiology is altered in some way. I'm just saying that I'm just talking about the notion of a disease process uh, or that there's some sort of physical causation of distress. However, a second or alternative way of thinking about how drugs work is what Moncrief calls um, the, the drug-centered model. And this was actually how drugs were originally conceptualized. And in this model, it is acknowledged that drugs do alter mental states. They do have psychoactive mind-altering properties. So they do affect thought processes, motions and perceptions, just as alcohol and a range of other psychoactive substances can as well as drugs that treat known physical disorders. This means that rather than seeing drugs as treating diseases, we can think about what particular mental effects the drugs are having, for example, creating sedation or suppressing emotions or dulling thoughts. And basically different drugs have different effects. They act in different ways on the various neurotransmitter systems. And furthermore, each drug will have a range of effects, many of which are referred to misleadingly, in my opinion, as side effects. And it's often the particular so-called side effects that influences choice of a particular drug, for example, choosing a sedative drug if you also want something to aid sleep. But of course, a lot of side effects are really adverse effects. And using this drug-centered model for thinking about how drugs work, we could simply prescribe drugs according to their various mental effects and whether we think its particular effects are likely to be helpful for particular mental experiences. So comparing these two models then, an analogy would be that aspirin um, is effective at relieving pain, which is a drug-centered model, but it doesn't mean that aspirin is correcting a disease causing the pain, a disease centered model, or that pain is because of an imbalance of the chemicals in aspirin. Alcohol is used as a way of managing anxiety very commonly, but alcohol isn't reversing an underlying disease process causing anxiety. One of the implications of a drug centered model is that you actually don't need a diagnostic classification of a specific disorder according to a classification system in order to decide what to prescribe. You need to have instead an understanding of the type of mental disturbance or distress a person is experiencing, for example, low mood, agitation or disturbed thoughts. And then you choose the drug whose effects are most likely to alleviate that particular mental experience. For example, whether you want a drug that has particular sedative effects or one that might numb emotions. I think I can stop sharing that slide now. So using this uh, drug centered model was actually how I thought about prescribing when working as a psychiatrist. But most psychiatrists are taught to think in a disease centered way that relies on being able to diagnose or classify types of disorders. And many healthcare professionals and the public believe, therefore, that you need to know the diagnosis in order to know what drug to prescribe. I personally did not think in this way, 
not least because of the questionable reliability and validity of psychiatric classification systems, which of course is another controversial topic, which I'm not going to go into now. However, many patients I saw wanted me to give them a diagnosis because they believed that with a diagnosis, they would get the right treatment. And of course, the mental health system is very diagnosis orientated too. So how we think about how drugs work, whether in a drug-centered or disease-centered way, has profound implications, I suggest, for how we understand the nature of mental disturbance and distress and how we go about alleviating it. Or to put it the other way around, how we conceptualize mental and emotional disturbance and distress, whether we think in terms of specific physical pathology or disease in the brain, or alternative ways of understanding distress, has profound implications for how we understand the role of drugs. And there are clearly implications here for how clients taking a psychiatric drug might see themselves, understand their own distress and what they think they need, which in turn may influence the ways in which they engage in therapy or don't engage, which I will elaborate on shortly. So that's something about how we understand how drugs work and what they do. For the remainder of this talk, I'm going to focus on some of the potential effects of psychiatric drugs on the therapeutic or therapy process. And I will briefly, out, I'll briefly offer you a framework for thinking about this. And let me try and bring up another slide here. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, I consider basically two, oh, that's the wrong slide. There we go. I consider basically two broad areas. So first of all, I consider the direct physiological effects of drugs on the body and brain and how this can affect the client. Secondly, I consider the subjective meanings and psychosocial consequences of taking a psychiatric drug and how these can impact on the therapy process. And I'll take these two in turn. So physiological effects, first of all, as I said just now, drugs do have psychoactive, i.e. mind, alter, mind altering properties, and these can be powerful in the way they affect thought processes, emotions and behaviours, as well as other physical effects such as dry mouth, nausea, and dizziness or reduced libido, commonly described as side effects, but which are really adverse effects. In terms of considering effects of drugs on thinking processes or, co or cognitions, some drugs may increase a person's level of alertness and arousal and, and stimulants do this, which can manifest as increased speed of thinking or increased concentration and attention. And, and rec recreational stim stimulant drugs do this too, such as cocaine. But many drugs have sedative effects that can slow down thought processes and lead to mental clouding. I'm just wondering if I'm still on the right side. Yeah, slide, right slide. And at the more extreme end, they reduce levels of consciousness. And these effects on concentration, attention, and also memory may be apparent in some clients and influence the way they engage with the therapeutic process. In terms of considering effects on emotions, some drugs reduce the intensity of emotions or even lead to a sense of detachment or indifference. For example, antidepressants can lead to this. And this can be helpful when a person's emotional state is acute and overwhelming, but it may not be helpful and may make it hard for other clients to engage in therapy, particularly therapy that focuses on emotional experiencing, where a client is trying to access emotions. It might, for example, interfere with a person's natural grieving process or getting in touch with and being with their sadness. All these effects may alter a person's judgments, decision-making ability, choices, desires, perceptions, their imagination, their creativity, 
or, or their sense of their sense of self, the sense of who they are, the kinds of experiences that may be a focus in therapy. Simply, drugs may influence what a person can bring into the therapeutic space. And of course, some of these mental effects of drugs can be distressing for people. The second area I consider are what are called meaning effects and the psychosocial consequences of taking a drug. And I suggest that it is here that therapists may play a key role in holding space for subjective meanings and consideration of the social consequences of taking a drug. So issues or questions that arise include that of how taking a psychiatric drug influences how the client sees themselves and their difficulties. A, a bit like receiving a psychiatric diagnosis, taking or being prescribed a drug may lead people to think of themselves as weak or defective, affecting self-worth and identity. And how does it lead others to see them? How does it influence relationships? A powerful social consequence is stigma and discrimination, for example, from family members or society. Does being prescribed a drug reinforce the idea that the client has a medical illness that needs an expert to treat it and that they have no control over their experiences? It might lead to avoidance of dealing with underlying problems and developing other ways of coping. If I take a drug that I might if I take a drug, then I might not have to address the circumstances in my life that are distressing me. And I can place the responsibility on the expert. So issues of personal agency are very relevant here. Some of these meanings relate to the drug centered and disease centered models. So does the client view taking a drug in a disease centered way, i.e. that the drug is correcting underlying pathology in the brain? And what are the implications of this? And what about what goes on in the prescribing process, i.e. the social roles of um, social roles and behaviors of prescriber and patient? And this means considering the power dynamics in the relationship. The placebo effect comes in here um, as well, believing that a drug, believing that a drug will help often enhanced by the perceived authority of the prescriber may increase the chances that it will. However, the power imbalance in the prescriber patient relationship can also lead to coercion and control on the part of the prescriber and interfere with the development of an exercise of personal autonomy. So there are a range of consequences in terms uh, of social roles, experiences and subjective meanings that arise when taking a psychiatric drug, in addition to the physiological effect on the brain and body. I also suggest that psychosocial consequences and subjective meanings are not routinely considered by professionals working in mental health settings. At least that was my observation. I wasn't, as a psychiatrist, encouraged to think about them. And as I indicated earlier, there often isn't time to give room for discussion on these things. There are, therefore, many potential implications for when a person is both taking a drug and having therapy. And I'll finish by considering uh, the issue of when taking a drug may complement or support the therapy process and when it might interfere or conflict with it. Now, this can be quite complex to think about. It is often assumed that taking a drug and having therapy is getting the best of both worlds, like covering all bases, so to speak. But each situation has to be judged individually. The questions here are whether drugs and therapy are trying to achieve the same thing or do different things whether they compete for the same ends, or if different ends, will these conflict with each other or be compatible? As I say, this is complex to think about, but just to offer a couple of examples. Someone seeing a therapist to work through grief may find this difficult if they are taking a drug that is numbing their emotions, as antidepressants commonly do. 
Grief work involves being with and working through distress and sadness. However, if prescribing a drug aims to suppress or eradicate distress, then therapy and drugs have different and conflicting aims. In contrast, someone who experiences intense and acutely overwhelming emotions may find it may find it helpful to take a drug to reduce the intensity of their emotional experience in order to more easily work with their experience through therapy. So here, drugs and therapy may complement each other. Um, I remember similarly, I remember once um, prescribing um, an antipsychotic drug for someone who who was very disturbed by their psychotic experiences, while her psychologist was able to do some work around her trauma. So I was able to work very collaboratively with the psychologist here. Returning to the disease-centered and drug-centered model of drugs, if a person sees their distress in an entirely disease-centered way, i.e. A brain, a brain problem as a brain problem, it may be that they are unlikely to engage with therapy if their expectation is that a drug will correct the underlying problem. But if they see their distress as not primarily brain pathology, but perhaps more as symptoms of other underlying psychological difficulties or difficult social circumstances, then a drug may be seen as being helpful in alleviating distress sufficiently for the person to address underlying difficulties using a, a very much the drug-centered model. There are lots of different permutations here, but to summarize, the key things to think about are what the specific purpose of a drug is and its intended mental effects, how the client sees the role of a psychiatric drug, what they want it to do, for example, uh, provide relief of symptoms or as a cure for a disease or a particular condition. It's important to think about the goals uh, or aims of therapy. Um, for example, uh, whether, whether this is to address specific experiences or particular symptoms such as anxiety, or to achieve wider change, um, such as developing self-understanding, self-compassion, or finding other ways of coping or processing trauma, or whether therapy is primarily about being some, some sort of empathic witness to a person's experiences. And whether drugs may complement or conflict with some of these aims. For example, how might taking a drug influence the client's expectations of therapy, which will influence how they engage with it? And does a drug affect a person physiologically in such a way that it makes it difficult for them to engage with a therapy process? So things such as sedation, poor concentration or emotion numbing effects. Now, much of this involves thinking about the different discourses around mental health, mental disorder and different forms of help and how they sit together in yourself as a therapist and your client. And that's what makes it um, very complex. Finally, um, Paul alluded to this earlier. I would really. Um, really suggest that, it, that it's, it's, it's helpful to be as mindful as possible of the unhelpful dualistic tendency, which is very much uh, in us in the, in the Western world, to think of drugs for the brain and therapy for the mind. This very much gets into debates about what, what, is, what is the mind and the relationship between the, the brain and mind. So this is where I will finish. But I hope this has either tempted you to uh, to enroll for the course later in the month or encouraged you to think about your CPD needs regarding this subject. Or if neither of those, I hope you have simply found this uh, talk interesting and informative. Thank you. Thanks Thank very you much. very much, Rachel. Thank you. Uh, I've put in the chat box, guys, uh, Rachel's course is running on 26th and 27th of October. And these are two half days. We're running from 9.30 to 12.30. So two mornings. You don't have to commit the whole day. You do training in the morning on Zoom 
and then you uh, do all your other things in the afternoon. Uh, and my first question, Rachel, is actually from me. Uh, and uh, you are all encouraged to write your questions in the chat box or put your electronic hand up so we could spot you and unmute you. Uh, but I will ask the first question, Rachel. Uh, the talk tonight um, touched on so many issues, which I think are incredibly relevant and um, uh, encourage us to think uh, and, and uh, process so many questions. The training on those two half days, where will you take it from here? So what mm. will be covered within the training? Yeah, sure. Um, um, I, will, I will talk a little bit, uh, give a little bit more background of the medical model. I mean, my, I, I come at the subject, I, or my, uh, yes, I come at the subject from a, certainly from a conceptual and sort of philosophical perspective, but the course also does um, include um, uh, basic information about drugs so I also talk about different types of drugs um, a bit more about how they work um, I will I will certainly um, talk a bit about side effects withdrawal effects those kinds of things um, what else I, I mean the the certainly thinking about the um, uh, working with clients who are taking psychiatric drugs I will talk a lot more about that um, the kinds of um, the kinds of questions or yeah issues that are um that are really important for, for therapists to think about so it's going to be sort of both kind of providing factual information um, um and and also sort of giving people the sort of conceptual tools to think through the issues thank you thank you uh we have a question uh from sharon uh who is asking is there a proactive step of reviewing medication for females going through the menopause? Oh, could you, sorry, Julia, would you mind repeating that? You broke up slightly in the middle of that. Is there a proactive step of reviewing medication for females going through the menopause? Um... Uh, I'm, must... not sure. I'm not sure what Sharon means in mm. terms of proactive step. Yeah. I think it's generally menopause medication yeah. and its effect on, on yeah. mental health and all the other issues. Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I suppose a couple of comments or, or, what, or one thing that springs to mind. Actually, I don't think um, psychiatrists, uh, I didn't think I really have a great deal of training uh, in uh, issues around the menopause. And actually, I probably that's probably true of doctors generally, actually. I think it's a, a much, um, yeah, neglected aspect of, of training. Um, in, terms of, in terms of drugs, I mean, yes, there are certain, well, certain types of drugs are commonly prescribed in the menopause, um, antidepressants being, being one of them. Um, I, but I, yeah, I, I certainly as a psychiatrist, it wasn't, yeah, it wasn't really a subject that, that came up very much, you know, within medical circles in terms of our own CPD. So, um, yeah, so I, I don't think there is much discussion in sort of general, uh, general clinical settings about it. I'm sure I think probably a specialist area um, for academics and, and researchers. So I'm sorry, I can't really comment much more on that. Well, it's very interesting because uh, I'm just talking to Paul right here. Maybe we need to find somebody who is specializing in this area because I, I quite agree with you, Rachel, that it, it always seen, often seen as a side issue and not really either researched yeah. or described for uh, with, with the complexity of the whole thing in mind. So yeah, we, we, we probably need to try to find somebody who's specializing in the field and provide a, a training on that. Um, Yvonne is asking, any advice about seizing medication suddenly? Um, yeah, I, I won't comment, and comment any further. So that's the question. Any advice about seizing medication suddenly? Mm, ceasing, you mean stopping? um yeah um oh absolutely uh don't <laughs> don't stop medication suddenly um i mean and and certainly the the longer you've been taking a medication um you know the general rule is to do so gradually um but that, that's a general rule anyway i it's always advisable to stop medication gradually because the withdrawal if there are 
there are the potential for withdrawal effects of taking psychiatric drugs. And that, this was something that's been very neglected within the medical profession, awareness of withdrawal effects of taking psychiatric drugs. And I hope things are changing, but I think doctors have been very bad at actually uh, warning people of the potential for withdrawal effects before starting to take a drug. Um, I, I think this is a sub, this is a topic that or an issue that is now get, gaining more attention, um, but um, um, about time too, really, because it is a serious problem. And um, it, yeah, uh, if you, or it, stopping um, stopping a medication suddenly can uh, cause very um, significant disturbance and distress. So. Um, very inadvisable. And I suppose I also to add um, that the uh, my advice would be to always try to do it under medical supervision. Now, I know I say that, but I also know that that's not easy. Um, it's not easy finding doctors that that might support you in wanting to stop a psychiatric drug. And it's certainly not easy getting the level of monitoring uh, for the process. Um, but it, but certainly the recommendation would be always to do it under medical supervision and not just to, to just do it, to, you know, take it upon yourself. But I, I know that a lot of people do just stop taking a psychiatric drug and, and don't consult their doctor. Thank you. I think, I think it's, it's a very relevant issue because uh, it is very often people are, are going through therapy uh, as a sort of a next step. And I think for therapists to be aware of it and, and mm. to warn them about uh, uh, the, the dangers of doing mm. it suddenly is important. Mm. Uh, well, Paulina is asking, will medication issues discussed in the course include drugs prescribed to children and adolescents? Will you talk um, about that? Mm. No, not not really, not in any detail, and that's that's partly because um, child and adolescent psychiatry was was not was not my specialty, so it's not an area that I actually have a great deal of knowledge. So, I mean, I I would have, I would have mentioned, or I will be mentioning, um, uh, yeah, one of one of the types of drugs that is prescribed uh, for the um, for ADHD, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, but um, but it, I wouldn't really be going into much detail about it. Um, yeah well yeah that that's i think that's the best way to say it you know if it's not your area then we won't be covering it in any depth but um yeah uh so um question to rather to me about recording of the course yes as all our courses it will be recorded and the recording will be immediately available to those who are booked on the course. Well, when I say immediately, we'll of course have to process and edit it, but two or three days after the course, it will be available to everyone who is booked on the course. So if you can't attend one of the sessions or you can't do either of the days, book on the course and you'll receive a recording two or three days later. So that's an option for those who can't make it on the day. Uh, and also these um, Thursdays are also recorded as you can see, and you can sign up to our YouTube channel and they are all uploaded there. It's actually a huge library now, so you can uh, look up all sorts of topics uh, which we have run during this 18 months. Um, uh, Ian is asking, how far do you think the pharmaceutical industry influenced, influences the prevalence of prescribing for mental health difficulties? It's a good question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, uh, massive influence. Uh, I mean, um, I mean, that's one of the um, um, well, big area of sort of controversy, really, that uh, the pharmaceutical industry has has had such a massive influence on the practice of doctors and have really shaped the discourse around the disease centered model um so um yeah i mean a lot could be said about the vested interests of pharmaceutical pharmaceutical companies um of course they make billions and billions of of uh, pounds of dollars um from the drugs 
uh, that they produce. Um, and I suppose just to add to that um, is that it, uh, that um, one of the criticisms of the DSM-5, that, that the Diagnostic Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, um, is that um, it in, in its, in its um, the sort of proliferation of, of diagnosis has led to this, the sort of increased market for drugs. There's a clear relationship between diagnosis and drug prescribing. Um, so, and uh, most of the members who uh, on, on the committee who wrote that manual, you know, had ties with the pharmaceutical industry. So um, yeah, uh, I think there's, um, there's a lot of very uh, important ethical questions around this. Undoubtedly. Um, there is, I, I'm very, very aware of time. There are some other questions and there is one question which uh, is a big one and I don't expect you to answer it tonight, but maybe you could think of it uh, about incorporating it into the training to, to get my note. Get, yes, get my notepad. <laughs> yes, it's a question from Monica. Uh, how do you manage the session when the client is under the influence of prescribed antipsychotic medication? Uh, so generally, just approaches to session with clients who are currently on on uh, on strong. Um, mind influencing drugs so mm. if, if we could incorporate incorporate some practical advice into the session uh guys there's many more questions and even more rachel of great compliments and thanks for for this session and it clearly i can i can read them through and it's uh it was really very 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 well received and i hope that it whetted your appetite and you will come to uh rachel's full course because we we are genuinely very excited about it and think it is something incredibly important for all therapists and counsellors to be aware of. So thank you very much for coming. I wish you all a happy World Mental Health Day on Sunday. And uh, you can unmute yourself and say your thanks. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, everyone. And see you. I think we're seeing you next week. We, we are having this Thursdays every week at the moment. So thank you very much and good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye